Hello to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots. We still have high hopes of delivering quality wrestling content, but if not, we'll sprinkle in some indie stars, you know, so we still get over. I am your host, a chef by trade. I am Mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and tonight, my people hailing from New England. He is the man with a lot of fancy holds. He's Brad Cashew. Brad, how are you, sir? Thanks for coming on and chatting about some wrestling. I'm doing great, Will. Glad to have you on. Glad to be here. Looking forward to a good conversation. Excellent, man. I, I always start a lot of these the same way. Let's talk about where wrestling started for you as a fan and then that point in your life where you were like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. Yeah, big fan growing up. Um, I liked watching it with my dad and my brother. Uh, I remember my first match. Uh, I remember seeing my dad's just, he's got uh, WCW Thunder on, giving my age a little bit. That was still on the air. Um, Disco Inferno go comes out and then gets destroyed by the Giants and just as like a little five or six year old, I was like, this is awesome. I'm all in on this. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I was actually exclusively a WCW fan growing up um, until the invasion. Then I was, I was team Alliance all the way. Um, but yeah, I've been a fan ever since uh, when I was around like junior high, early high school age. I remember like some of the top guys were like Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar. And I knew that they had, really good amateur backgrounds. They were collegiate national champions. Angle was an Olympic gold medalist with a broken freaking neck, as we all know. Um, so I thought if I ever want to do this in my life, I better join my high school wrestling team. I better become a really good amateur wrestler. So uh, I did that. I, I wrestled through high school and through college um, and uh, really built up my like base of athleticism through amateur wrestling, knowing that one day I'd want to get into the ring. Where did you start your training for professional wrestling? I started at the New England Pro Wrestling Academy back in uh, 2011. I was actually still actively in college at the time. Um, so that was about 11 years ago. I've not been in wrestling for 11 years. I've been a fan for way longer than that. But yeah, I, I started up then uh, and I was able to go for like the summer, early fall, once like school year kicked back in. Uh, I was kind of out of both like time and money. Um, Man, looking back, like I, I like could have made it work maybe, but I was like already kind of scraping by with with not much. So my thought was, all right, let's let's take care of school. Let's get a degree so I can fall back on that. Um, you know, let's save up some money so I'm not making like tough decisions about like, you know, can I afford a meal tonight versus like my gas bill to get up to the school. Um, and yeah, so I, I actually, I didn't wind up getting back to training uh, for a while longer. It wasn't until 2019 uh, that I was back at it. Uh, but yeah, it's since, since then, it's uh, I've been all in all the way. And uh, yeah, it's been going great. It's a hell of a ride. And uh, just glad to be part of this place. So with your amateur background coming out of high school and then going into transitioning into professional wrestling, when I watch your tape, you have a ton of like technical moves. You you go a hundred miles an hour, but you don't ever lose that technical advantage. Do you think that is stemming from that amateur background from when you started in high school? Yeah, absolutely. Like um, practices in in high school and college. Like I mean, even even just coming from high school. Like when I when I first trained, I was only nineteen. I I didn't have like that that full college background yet. All I had was my my high school wrestling time. But still, I'd gone through practices where. We're basically going live full strength, getting in a ton of reps on, on takedowns and reversals and counters and doing that for like a two hour session. So when I come here and I'm like, oh, like a long match is like 15 minutes. Now it's a different kind of impact. It is actually like incredibly draining to have a pro wrestling match for that long. But like I've gone through some really, really long amateur practices. Like I'll, I'll say when I was in college, our preseason I mean, we would we would have seven practices a week. It was six days because we'd have uh, uh, we'd double up on Saturday. We'd do a lift in the morning, and then we'd be on the mats in the afternoon. Um, but yeah, no, dude, we had, we would have practices two straight hours. And it, so I I'm not shy about the fact I went to Boston University. Uh, they're a Division One program. Um, no, I walked onto the team. I was good in high school. Like I was captain of my team, placed at states, um, was a top wrestler at a mass. But like the Division One level is super super competitive and elite like my all my friends on the team it was just like minnesota state champion michigan state champion like top four in jersey like top four in ohio was people that were just really really good from all over the country so there was no real like weak link in that training room anybody you're you're going against it's it's like a shark tank you're just trying to keep up and like you know every like takedown is something that you can like be proud of there 
Uh, so yeah, that was just living that like college wrestling starts in like, man, we start practices around like September and we go till like spring break in March. So it was just doing that like five, six days a week, um, for some of those like most important years in my life, um, to like build up that base. It's, it's definitely something that's carried over because now like coming to the pro game and working on some of these takedowns and stuff, it's like, you know, I might do it a little differently in an amateur match, but it's a motion that I've practiced and I've hit like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. So like, I'm, I'm ready to go. I can make it look smooth. I can hit it hard and I can do it well. So a lot of guys, when they, when they talk about their matches inside the squared circle, uh, they use a phrase calling it in the ring. A lot of guys I've talked to and I've had a chance to, to have a conversation with and talk shop have said that their amateur background has helped them with being able to call it in the ring because you're so adaptable and you're, you have the muscle memory of what these holds feel like. So it's more fluid when you have that background. Um, so it's not necessarily the same question back to back, but when you're in the ring calling it in the ring, do you feel more comfortable because of your amateur background? Because you Absolutely. can flow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an amateur match, a college match, it, at most it's seven minutes. So unless you can pin somebody, you gotta make you gotta make do with that seven minutes and score points where you can. And when you're against somebody that's a really high level, they're not gonna give you any freebies. Yeah. You've got to like take it like you have to like set the position how you need it. You need to adapt to whatever they're doing. So uh, I'm used to being able to read that situation and come up with that counter or come up with that best way to, to change the advantage. Um, so with that, like, yeah, I, I can call it on the fly because I'm never going to freeze. I always know like where I am and what's possible and what's available. Um, so let's talk about when you're working outside of an amateur thing, you have a, a lot of like, in your in your in ring work, I don't like to say high flying stuff, but you display a lot of agility when you work in ring what are some of the biggest things you do to prepare for a match knowing that you're gonna to have some of these high spots and some of these uh little bit more athletic feats that you're gonna have to go through i'm fearless that's it when it comes to like jumping off the top or anything like that i mean uh i'll i'll give some credit to like amateur wrestling I'll, I'll give some like you know me as a kid before i even got into amateur wrestling like my house was like I like me and, and my brother, like we were the ones with the trampoline and we're like putting it under trees and ladders and stuff. And like, so there was always that, like chasing that adrenaline rush of like, can I get, you know, can I go a little bit higher? Can I do a flip on this? So I kind of like train myself mentally for that. Then I get into amateur wrestling where it's like, you know, you could have all eyes in the school, like watching you home match, like senior net, whatever it is, you have a really, really big match and you might have a really tough opponent. And if you're afraid, you're going to psych yourself out and get your own head. So I'm trained. I know how to just take that fear and like channel it into adrenaline. So I, I know I have the athleticism to pull off a lot of like high flying moves and a lot of agility. Um, and it's really just making sure you don't have that fear that's going to hold you back. Do you have a spot yet that you were like, man, I can't believe I just pulled that off? That's a good question. There's sometimes, I think the first time I've wound up hitting it a few times. Um, I was a very big fan of the hurricane growing up. I was nine years old. I was the hurricane for Halloween. Um, he did this really cool move where he'd have somebody like, someone would be trying to like get him with a superplex and he'd like stop them and they'd both be on the top rope and he'd like take their head and hit a swinging neck breaker with both guys on the top rope. I think the first time I hit that was against Alec Price last summer. And it was kind of like, a, you know, we were in the position for it and it was sort of like, am I going to be able to pull this off? And like, because it's, it's still very difficult. I mean, like Shane Helms is, a, a fantastic wrestler that's a that beast just calling, yeah um so like to be able to pull pull that off and like um you know it's it's cool like just knowing it was like because like i did believe in myself like i'm gonna be able to hit this it's gonna work um but there's still a little bit of that like doubt like oh, do i really can i get the rotation right can i get this so um yeah I, I know i hit it that one time that was back at uh at summer chaos for chaotic um that was yeah back august of last year so almost a full year ago i've i've only really been able to hit that a couple other times since then 
Um, I think I've only hit it maybe like two or three times in my career, but yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite moves uh, that I've been able to pull out. Um, I also just like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not so like, I'm always going to do whatever it takes to, to, to win. And I don't want to just have a move be like, it's a tribute or like, I'm like a fanboy, but like, you know, I, I am a fan. I grew up liking this stuff. So I do like that. I was a huge fan of the hurricane and I, I like can pull off one of his moves and do a justice. Um, I got another one of my uh, moves. I hit a good amount. I've never been able to win with it, but there's this, um, it's uh, an Alabama slam, but you sit out with it. Um, one of the commentators called it the Nutville slam. And I was briefly, uh, I was billed from Nutville uh, when I was very early on um, the uh, the famous uh, legendary city of Nutville. But uh, yeah, it, it had been called the Nutville slam. It's a sit out Alabama slam. I got that watching uh, Chris Canyon, actually. I was a big fan of Canyon. Uh, like I said, I was a WCW guy, um, but it's cool being able to kind of work into my own repertoire some of uh the guys who i think really helped make me a fan and uh and get me into this so you brought up the prize alec price um mm -hmm. i've recently interviewed him he's the limitless champ you yourself have some limitless days coming up as well uh what has your time been with or how has your time with limitless been yeah so i started wrestling for limitless about a little over a year ago um i came in and people of Maine have just been disrespectful to me from day one and really? I just don't particularly care for it. So, um, you know, I think I'm just going out and being myself, but yeah, the people from Maine have been very antagonistic toward me. So I'm not one to just take that line down. So I of course give it back to them and, and let them know that I don't really care for their attitudes. Uh, but I've been able to have some, some great matches and great opponents uh, in limitless. Uh, I'm really proud of a lot of the work that I've been able to do there um there's yeah I, I could roll through a lot of matches that i just i i'm really proud of going back about a full year um i i had a match with uh iron rip bison that i feel really proud of there's one i had with davy n um that was coming right out of the um well, there's the first one i had in limitless that was before we were even back to crowds um there's uh, a few times i've wrestled becca uh that have gone really well uh and then i i've had some some really fun experiences being able to work with dirty dango scotty too hotty uh at gangrel recently um and yeah i believe my most recent match there uh was with the big bufa desmond cole um he did get the better of me on that occasion. I'll give him, I'll give him some credit. He did outsmart me and beat me at my own game. So you got one Des. all right, but Bufa, this ain't over. So when you have a chance to work with guys like Gangrel and Scotty too hottie, when you work with veterans that have been in the industry as long as they have been, uh, what are some of the biggest things you take away from those matches? So while I'm competing against them, it's always, you know, I'm, I'm a student of the game. I'm a, I'm a college graduate. I'm, I'm a lifetime learner. I'm always improving my game. As, as soon as I stop improving, then I'm done. I'm like out of this. So I'm always looking to get better. So even as I'm trying to beat somebody like a gangrel, I'm noticing the way that he maybe positions himself or things that he might do um, to help, like help himself uh, like build some momentum or how he's positioned himself for some moves or what he's kind of going for. Um, so really noticing some of those little things, a lot of times, uh, what'll make like the gif or the, the big photo, uh, like the big photo op from it will be that one really big move, that big high spot, whatever. Um, it's a lot of those like in-betweens where you see that real like mastery that you can only get through either, you know, 20 plus years in wrestling or taking the time to really carefully study, uh, and try to apply it to your own game. Nice. Um, when you look at some of the things you've done at Limitless and then you go somewhere like Chaotic Wrestling, you've got some dates with Chaotic coming up too. Do you see a huge difference between the fan bases when you go from uh, promotion to promotion or territory to territory? Yeah, it's uh, even though there is a lot of overlap, there's some people that I'll see everywhere, uh, but every place has its own feel. Every place has got its own energy and uh, that's important to just keep in mind when you go in especially if you're someone like uh you know the chaotic fans they give me a lot of support and a lot of love so from there a lot of times i'm feeding off of that energy um, i'm really like letting it fuel me and, and help me 
Like, you know, it's something I can rely on. It's like, it's like a home game versus an away game. Limitless is definitely an away game. For there, I know that they're not going to be nice to me. They are going to say very disrespectful things to me. They're going to curse at me. Um, they're going to question uh, all of my life choices. And uh, with that, it's like, all right, I just got to, you know, let that fuel me in a different way. So it's just, it's prepping your mind. Uh, so like, am I going to get encouragement? And it's like, all these people have my back or am I basically fighting everyone in this arena right now? Either way, it can get me fired up. Like I'm good with it. Like I'm somebody that can feed off that energy no matter what. Uh, and I take pride in that, but yeah, you do got to kind of know what you're getting into. And that's something that could be fun about going someplace new. I actually, uh, I just wrestled at fight life down in rhode island that was uh like two three weeks ago and for that one it was again not really sure how they'd respond to me and uh you know kind of trying to tease that out and figure out all right if that's some place that i'm going to be coming back to which i do plan to be what are they kind of giving me and how am i gonna kind of reshape my game based on that so a lot of people say when they work on their characters and their gimmicks and they're building their in-ring personality outside their work, they turn up a little bit of their everyday life to 11. What part of Brad gets turned up to 11 when he's in a match? Um, I'd say like my intensity uh, and just like my focus, my determination. Like I, I am a generally pretty intense person, uh, like outside of the ring as well. I'm somebody who goes hard on everything I do. Um, but yeah, I think something that's important to take away, a lot of times people talk about like your character or your persona, like I'm me. I think if you're trying too hard to like be somebody who makes it, then you're being fake and like everyone can see that and, and you can like see through it. Like I'm me, whether you like me or you don't like me, whether the crowd's for me or against me, I'm still just showing different aspects of the real person that I am. Um, so you know, the cameras are on, you might think like, oh, it's just an act. You're like pretending stuff. It's no, no, no. For me, it's like, you know, in Maine, I'll show some different aspects of me when I'm in front of that limitless crowd. Then when I'm chaotic, it might be other parts of it, but it's the same way as like, you're, you're a different self when you're with one friend group versus if you like go to work and you're talking to your work friends, then you're back with like your old high school friends and stuff. That's how I see it with wrestling. So um, I think if anybody like if anybody out here is listening to this and thinking about like, you know, Oh, what do I do for my character? My like, it's like, dude, if you got to think that hard, then you're being fake. And like, it's, it's going to shine through. So just be yourself, find something that's like, I don't know, you can attach to and, and feels like genuine because when you're genuine, everybody can, can tell. So I've always just been me, um, different aspects of the full me, but uh, yeah, all this is just, me being who I am. There's a, a phrase in journalism, when you're writing a piece, you have to read the room or know your audience. When you step into the squared circle and you're getting ready for a match, do you feel like that's just as important for you when you get in the ring to be able to read the room and know your audience, to know what, the, what you're gonna need to do to get a pop, how you're gonna get over, or if you're playing as a heel, how to get the heat that you need. Uh, do you read the audience for that? So really the goal is no matter what, like whatever we're getting, I'm trying to win the match. That's, that's priority number one. So if I can also get some energy that's going to help me like one way or the other, whether it's, like I said, like it's, it's a home game, I'm feeding off the crowd or it's an away game and I'm like feeding off their hatred. That can be something that I, I have to like help my case and get me there. Um, but ultimately like when I'm getting in the ring, I'm thinking about my opponent and how well do I know them? It might be somebody where I've got their move set known inside and out i've seen them wrestle a bunch of times I, i've wrestled them a bunch of times i know what to do against them i know what they're looking for sometimes it's a totally fresh opponent somebody i've never seen before um and there i've got to kind of feel it out a lot of times I'll, I'll say this a lot of times i learn a lot from the lockup as soon as you lock up with somebody sometimes you can tell if they're scared of you if they're going to back down or if they're going to really bring it and you're like all right guess i'm in for a fight today so I always like to, you know, try to pay attention to what my opponent's doing, seeing if they're sending me any signals that I can pick up on. So a lot of guys have told me that the collar and elbow at the beginning of the match is kind of the once upon a time 
for the story that you guys are going to tell. Lots of trainers have used that reference with me. If you were going to look at the collar and elbow tie-up as a once upon a time, do you think it's the most important move in wrestling? Hmm. I know that's a big question. That's loaded. That's, that, that is like also an interesting way to think about it because it's like to say it's the most important move. Um, it's, it's also kind of like saying like the, like my gut reaction is no, because you can't win with it. Oh, I've got a follow-up uh, question. That's just going to be just as hard for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you like uh, something I'd say is like a, an interesting parallel to it is um, what's the most important match in a card. A lot of people will say the main event. But there's also a really good argument to be made for the opener because that's going to set the tone. So it's essentially, is your, is your opener what's more important? It's like, I, you know, I don't have a good answer, but like, I'm going to give you some credit, Will. I do like that question. <laughs> that's, that's getting me thinking. The follow-up, I always ask if the once upon a time is a collar and elbow, then what would be the, uh, the, the happily ever after or the end of a match then? Like, what would be, how is the process for you when you start building your finish? Um, so for me, uh, I'll usually, my best weapon I have, and, and yo, I'll advertise, I put it on a shirt. Like, I don't care if anybody's trying to scout my game. My best weapon is the shellacker. It's a spin and heel kick. Um, I get a lot of sauce on it. You know, my legs are super strong from having to stand in a wrestling stance for two hour practices all through high school and college. So I've got strong legs and if I kick you in the head with them with added rotational momentum, I'm gonna knock somebody out. So if I hit that kick, it's done. I usually try not to go for it till I've really got somebody like weakened. Um, and that's because like, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to hit it, I know it's going to be it, but I also, it's, it's a vulnerable position to put myself into because the spin kick, I do need to turn my back on my opponent and I'm going to be more off balance going up on one foot and reaching my foot up toward their face. So if I miss it, I can potentially put myself in a tough situation. I'll say my, my most, uh, one of my most recent matches I had in chaotic, it was a beat the clock challenge match. I've got 632 to beat Trigger the OG. I was swinging for that thing from the jump. Like I, I never wound up hitting him with it. There was a little bit of shenanigans at the end that kept me from uh, being able to get the win I deserved. But um, I was going for that a lot. Was never really able to put him away with it because I never connected with it. I actually think looking back on my strategy, probably should have maybe set him up a little bit better in order to go for it. Maybe I could have saved myself some time um, and then would have been able to maybe get that with a little bit more time on the clock at the end. But um, for me, like that's my exclamation point. Like that's my end of the, the, of the sentence is hitting that move, hitting the shellacker. It's all done. Um, and I'd like to think that just about anybody, whoever you are, when you're a wrestler, whatever you're putting the match away with, it should be like, it's done. You got them. Like, I've, I, I'll admit, like, I win some matches sometimes just like I am a good amateur wrestler. I can catch someone with a good technical roll up. I can use leverage and momentum. And, and I've actually had some of my wins I'm most proud of being able to, like, catch somebody. But the best, most satisfying wins, this was something my um, one of my college coaches said is it's like you want to finish the match. Like you don't want to, you don't want to be up by 10 and then you start coasting in the last 45 seconds. Cause you know, you've already won and maybe you give up a takedown and then you finish out the match on bottom. Like, no, no, no. Even though you are going to win that one, like you might see that guy again at the national tournament, you might see him again next year. So you want them to walk off the mat feeling like I got beat. So even if you're up by 10, even if you're up by 12, push the pace, go for that takedown, go for that next move. You don't want to just beat people. You want to break people. So I take that into the squared circle. I don't want to just beat you by catching you. I can do that. But if I can nail you with my kick, leave you out cold, then you know that I'm the better man. I won this time. So when you're in a match, which do you feel you get the biggest rush from when you get somebody to tap out or pinning their shoulders for the one, two, three? Hmm. Having an amateur background and a striking proficiency, which do you think makes you feel more successful in the ring? Pinning a man for the one, two, three, or making him tap? I'd say, I think I'd lean pin. And it's just because it's more like, because the question was about like, what's a better adrenaline rush? Yeah. With pin, you kind of like, you don't really know for sure. Even if you got him with like your best shot, there's always that little bit of doubt that they might like 
just be, barely be able to kick out or something like that. So it, there is that rush. And even if you don't hit your best move, sometimes on a pin, it's like, oh, may, maybe that just got me just enough. That knocked them out for four seconds. Well, I only needed three, so there's the win. I feel like, now, I think some people will probably disagree with me on this. I can tell pretty much as soon as I get the submission locked in, whether or not there's even a chance it'll be a tap out. A lot of times, like if I get it in, I'll, I'll know in my head, like when I lock something up and it's like, this is going to do some damage and this is going to like help keep the match in my favor. But like their, their position just isn't there for it. They're going to be able to get out of this. Like they're going to be able to eventually get to the ropes or withstand it or something. I have one matches by submission, but it is like, once I get that hold locked in, I know that it's like, all right, this is as tight as it can be. I've got this on perfect. It's just like, you know, count to 10. They're probably going to tap by five. <laughs> but um, yeah, for me, it's like that unknown rush of like the pin. Is it going to work? Is it not? Like that's that's where that that kind of gets me that adrenaline going. Nice. All right, Brad. Well, I end all of my interviews with five rapid fire questions, some with wrestling, some without. I've got your five queued up. You ready to roll? Let's do it. What is your favorite venue you've wrestled in so far? Uh, man, it's supposed to be rapid fire now. Now I'm hesitating. Uh, my favorite <laughs> venue, I would say, uh, the Boston Marriott Burlington. That was summer chaos for chaotic, uh, 2021. What is your favorite city that I've wrestled in? Just in general, just in general, Boston, yeah. Massachusetts, not close. That's a, that's a good one. My, mine's Nashville. I'm from Nashville. Are you originally from Boston? I'm from right outside Boston. I grew up outside the city, went there for college, um, then lived there for about 10 years after. Nice. So I'm assuming Red Sox, Bruins. Always. Yeah. Poor. I'm a Red yeah. Sox fan. Nashville never got a baseball team, so I've always been a Red Sox fan. Picked a good one. Uh, what's your favorite food? Ooh. Um, I'm going to go with Greek yogurt. Great protein and just uh, and good for you. That's a very athlete answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a nutritionist in college say that she considered Greek yogurt to be more in the meat category than the dairy just because of the macros. That makes sense. What is your favorite music? Not a musical artist, but a genre of music. Hmm. Man, it depends on it depends on my mood. I'm going to give a, a little bit of a uh, maybe unusual answer. I'll do classical piano sonatas. Oh wow, that's big. Focus, man. It's focus. When and I was in like, when I, when I was in my undergrad, I studied just, music and classical music is intense, man, no matter what. Like yeah. It, yeah, it can move you to tears or make you mad as hell. Classical music has a lot of emotion in it. Yeah, I can work out to it. It's kind of cool sometimes putting on like Beethoven and just the little lift Chopin it. while you're lifting. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite finisher that isn't yours? Hmm. The Stone Cold Stunner. Always a solid pick. Um, all time great. I, hang on. I might. Diamond Cutter. Diamond Cutter's like, they're so close to being like almost the same move. I think you still got to give the Stunner to Steve Austin's the man. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to put DDP in the Diamond Cutter. That's my number two. Well, if you're going to bring up the Cutter, then I have to be the. Uh the devil or the the what would what it be called i'd give you the other side of it if ddp did the diamond cutter what do you think about the rko then oh rko is great i love it like as a tribute i love the whole like rko out of nowhere thing that happened because yeah. i mean like like i don't see that as like stealing from ddp it's a continuation it's just like the next generation being able to see it like i like loved it they like the stuff like orton's been able to do with that been like so creative and just inventive how we can get to it from anywhere um so yeah no i love the diamond cutter i loved all the different ways ddp could get to it um love the way that orton's been able to continue that on um and the way that like about 50 percent of the guys on in the indies now because everybody uses it <laughs> can also still <laughs> continue that on so cutters for everybody baby it's kind of like a super kick now it's one of those things that just kind of everybody has a version of it yeah. <laughs> All right, Brad, this is my favorite part of every episode because I don't have to say anything. Just plug your stuff. Tell everybody what you have coming up and where you're going to be in the near future. Word. Yeah. Catch me at Limitless. I'm going to be there uh, Saturday, July 23rd. I do believe is the date. The show is crunch time. I'm going to qualify for the Vacation Land Cup, baby. 
Vacation Land Cup, VLC taking it home. I've never had a shot at the Limitless Heavyweight Championship. I want that title. I want that shot. I've strung together some impressive wins, and now I'm going to make this a reality. I'm going to get that championship around my waist. So that's coming up Saturday, July 23rd, crunch time, Limitless Wrestling in Yarmouth, Maine. After that, Friday, July 29th, chaotic countdown. In that chaotic countdown match, 30 people enter at staggered intervals. We all know that match type. Winner gets a title shot at Summer Chaos. I talked about my match from Summer Chaos last year. I defended the New England Championship against Alec Price in the opener. Well, this year I want to be in the main event and I want to be fighting for the heavyweight championship. So I want to win that chaotic countdown. I want to punch my ticket to Summer Chaos and be able to fight for the heavyweight title. So those are the next two shows coming up for me. That takes me to the end of July. Um, so check out Limitless Wrestling. Uh, check out Chaotic Wrestling. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, I am at it's cashew time, all one word. Um, and yeah, it's been cool uh, talking with you, Will. Thanks for having me on this. All right, Brad, I appreciate you stopping by. And now as we close another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots, I want to take a minute and thank you for listening. Remind you to go wherever you do anything on the internet. Like, follow, subscribe, unsubscribe, then subscribe again. Leave a comment telling me how great I am or how terrible I sound. Either way, it helps the algorithm. For Brad Cashew, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.